Hi again, everyone. Welcome to another episode of RV Business Capital Talk, sponsored by Eric Sell. I'm Rick Kessler, and with me, Sherman Goldenberg. We're from RV Business, and we have three gentlemen joining us today, all from the RV Dealer Arena. Phil Ingracia is the president of the RV Dealers Association. Chris Andro is from Hemlock Hill RV, and that's in Southington, Connecticut. And also Travis Creech. Travis is from Rex and Sons, and that's just outside Wilmington, North Carolina, I believe. That's right. Very good. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. And let me set the stage here real quick for everybody watching. We are recording this on the eve of what would be Hurricane Milton's landfall. And one of the main reasons why we have Travis here is being in North Carolina, he is well positioned to talk about the aftermath of Hurricane Helene's devastation in that state. Um, it's it's kind of an awkward uh, timing because we got Milton on the doorstep right after oh. Helene, we showed her <laughs> the back door, I guess. Um, Travis, how did your dealership fare through all of uh, that devastation? Um, my de my dealership here on the on the coastline did well. Um, spoke with most of um, well, spoke with all the dealers that are in uh, the North Carolina RV Dealers Association, and uh, got word from all those dealerships that they are doing they're doing well. They can be a resource, you know, in the areas that they're at. Um, so, uh, you know, pretty, pretty fortunate as far as, um, RV dealerships go. Travis, one of the other, uh, uh, positions that you can speak from or perspectives is, is you're a, an authorized vendor with FEMA. Um, that's actually something that I've always been curious about. What does that mean? And, and how does that whole FEMA program work for you? Uh, so doing business with the government, um, you have to be registered, you know, to to be a contractor with with the government. And uh, I think something that a lot of dealers don't realize is that it is a process uh, doing business such as with Homeland Security of FEMA division. Um, so there's a process after, you know, uh, uh, storms uh, or natural disasters to where they have to come in, they have to search and rescue, you know, first, and then they can assess uh, the situation as far as uh, how many folks need help uh, with some temporary housing. Um, and so all that's done through process of, of insurance and, and also following with FEMA. Um, it doesn't just happen overnight. Approvals don't just happen overnight. And, and then from that point, um, that's when FEMA can, you know, assess how many folks are in need. And that's when they can reach out to the resources uh, and set out a bid uh, for those resources to to bid on the contracts. And then there's a process on getting it all done and, of course, getting paid and all that fun stuff that, that comes along with that. We've, we've heard some conflicting reports. Is FEMA currently, when we're doing this video, uh, involved in emergency housing at this point, to your knowledge? Anybody? There's there's no solicitation out um, at this time um, uh, to the date of this video, um, but I have uh, I have seen some reports where you know FEMA is assessing uh, and they're looking for um, you know how many folks do need temporary housing, for example, in the state of North Carolina, you know where we just had a devastating uh, hurricane on the western side. So this there's is a, several days. A website, even, not a week. There's a website called sam.gov and they will put their solicitations for FEMA requests for whatever you're contracting for, whether it's travel trailers for emergency housing or other things related to, like generators and things like that that they need. So dealers can can check that out. But as Travis said, there is a process that you have to go through. And on their website, they also have uh, instructions on how to do business with FEMA. That's correct, and they'll have their they'll have their certain uh, requirements of exactly what they're looking for, and you have to stay between those guidelines on exactly what they're looking for in those areas. Okay, so it, it sounds like uh, um, sounds like it's a process, and it'll take as long as it takes. It does. I've 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 seen it uh, in my dealings with FEMA. It's been 
well, well over a month after a devastation before, you know, we even can start putting actions in motion, you know, to be a relief in, in those areas. Okay. Okay. I Phil, I know you, you wanted to add something to this discussion too, and that's what uh, uh, RVDA resource. Right. Uh, earlier this summer, RVDA through the RV Learning Center announced an RV dealership employee emergency relief fund. And this was set up through the generosity of the Ron and Lisa Fennick Family Foundation. And what this fund does is provide up to $2,500 in emergency relief assistance in cash to RV dealership employees that are facing um, you know, hardships due to natural disasters like what we are experiencing this month in both the Carolinas and, and in Florida. So uh, we have complete information on the uh, RV Learning Center website. And uh, right now we've had about five dealership employees apply. Uh, we've approved two of those requests so far. Mm -hmm. And really we just launched this just a few weeks ago. So um, the timing uh, was good. Uh, as far as, uh, you know, being able to help during these situations. And uh, the Fennec family, very, very generous, um, wanting to give back to um, the dealership employees. And I do want to stress it's for the dealership employees, not the owners, but dealership employees impacted by, uh, by natural disasters. And we'll be um, sharing more news about the program with the members uh, at the upcoming convention next month. Uh, in our annual meeting and in our other general sessions. But uh, yeah, the, the program is literally, we just started it just a few weeks ago and it's already being used by employees uh, in different parts of the country. Bill, do you have a, um, where, go where, ahead, like, go ahead. Where, where would you like people to go to get more information on that in the meantime? Well, they can go to rvlearningcenter.com and click on our resources link and there's an application and it explains the program in full. And we're also communicating it through uh, our email. Uh, Travis was good enough to send it out to the North Carolina RVDA members uh, last week during their, um, you know, during their uh, situation. So we're, we're, we're getting it out there to the affected areas uh, directly as well. Okay. Can we uh, address the market in general, the, the other uh, storm that uh, we're dealing with? And uh, what what can you all tell us about uh, this, the current status uh, as we head towards the fourth quarter here uh, uh, of the American RV industry? Where are we at? Chris, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, He's okay. thinking about it. He's thinking about it. I can tell. Well, you told me I talked about the convention. Yes. Yeah, so anyway, um, boy, sure. That's a that's a that's a tough question, right? I mean. Um, I, I think that our industry is, is, you know, poised to recover very nicely here in 25. I think the rest of this year with everything that's going on, at least on the East coast, you know, is just, um, you know, it, it's hard to recover from something like that in some of these States. Um, truthfully, you know, 24 has not been a great year. We, we all know the numbers, um, I think we're still kind of paying the price for a little bit of inventory uh, um, problems in 23 that we, you know, we're finally getting through. I'm encouraged by what I'm seeing with a lot of the numbers coming through. Uh, it, it, speaking for, you know, the Northeast and, and my dealership alone, you know, the, the end of uh, July and August, they were not great months. And September wasn't wasn't much better. I know Hershey was fantastic, according to what I'm hearing, but it's a show. And, and you know, it's it, it's it's been growing and growing. So I kind of expected that. But um, I think mid-25, hopefully we'll have seen the bottom and maybe a little bit of daylight once politics settle down, interest rates settle down you know, and, and, and we kind of can start pushing our way forward. I, I think we have a great future. Don't get me wrong. I think, you know, if, if our industry is definitely growing and, and we're poised to do that. We just did a dealer survey with Baird uh, and we're in the field with another one. We do it every month. And 
like Chris was saying, long-term dealer sentiment is improving. I think part of that is we're seeing, you know, some moderation in interest rates. So that's good for, for next year. And then, uh, you know, according to the, the inventory checks down the, you know, down the supply chain, dealers have cleaned up inventory. So we should see stair step increases in shipments as dealers kind of have to, to restock a little bit. Now, the, the question will be, can we get that retail back to where we need it to be? And, uh, you know, that's where the, the election uncertainty and still people may be trying to wait out for their interest rate cuts. They may be staying on the sidelines even a little bit longer than we might have thought. But it does look like we're poised to have an improved market in 2025. But how much, we? it's hard to say right now. There's a there's a bit of positivity in the market is what we keep hearing. And and that's kind of the conclusion we're drawing out of Hershey. Um, and and uh, obviously this sets the scene uh, for the RVDA convention expo coming up doesn't it yeah i i think it really really uh sets the scene very well i think there's some great momentum going into it uh especially you know uh given that everybody is really hoping to get out of 24 and get into 25 <laughs> uh, i want one one point on on your last question sure I, I have to also commend our partners in this industry, you know, all, you know, we're talking about dealers right here, right now, but the manufacturers have really worked really well with dealers that I can tell to, to get that inventory back in line and with run rates and partnering up and, you know, pre COVID it was, you know, stack them high and let them fly. And now it's not that at all. It's, 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 we need to, we need to do something that makes sense for everybody. And, you know, Flipping it a little bit over to the convention, you know, Phil, you tell me if I'm wrong, but I, I've been doing the convention chair, what, I did it 18, 19, 22, and 3, maybe now, I can't, I don't know, I'm lost on the, the years, <laughs> but, you know, from then till now, the participation between both organizations, RVDA and RVIA, and suppliers and vendors, and, and has just really we we all know we all feel it so strong that we're we're so much better together than we are you know fighting each other and and I think that's why we're I think twenty five and twenty six and beyond we're really poised to to grow our industry again and and at the convention you know connecting and collaborating is really the main focus of the of the committee I mean it's been that way for years now and it's just kind of been part of it you know. Um, Travis, to your point, I think if you miss the convention, you're going to miss all that collaborating about the FEMA stuff. Not that we have any sessions on FEMA, but it's it's the networking and talking with the right manufacturers and talking with the dealers who experienced it and can share a wealth of information in those in those opportunities that we have set up at the convention. I think that alone is worth the money to go out there. Sorry, I'm, I'm selling a little bit. Sorry. No, that's quite all right, Chris. Um, quick question, because one of the things that uh, we just got not that long ago from Eric Sisk, uh, from your on your staff, Phil, and that is um, the the OEM dealer meetings. You've got uh, to me, it seems like you've got a, a, a longer lineup than you have normally. Yeah, yeah. we do. We sure do. And um, Chris, you know, those are dealer only meetings, and Chris attends those. And I know Travis, you've been to them. I'll let them talk about what goes on, but they're really, really uh, uh, important uh, for uh, for dealers and top manufacturing leaders to get together. And it's a it's a it's a conversation between the leaders of the dealership group and the manufacturers. So it's a really unique opportunity. Travis, what uh, what do you go ahead? No, I was well, going to tell I would just, I'm sorry, Chris, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I was going to offer the floor to you because I want to hear your perspective. Yeah, I would just say, you know, coming uh, coming back from open house, um, you know, there's there seemed to be a lot of positivity, a lot a lot more, uh, uh, a lot better help uh, as far as dealing with bodies with their inventories. And also the outlook, you know, seems a lot more positive. And, you know, from my experience, um, from a, a family RV business, you know, for 27 years, going to the convention is really where you get a chance to really network, 
um, like you said, with like Chris said, with other dealers, but also, you know, with these uh, doing these partners with the um, manufacturers, you know, you want to call it the complaint department. <laughs> well, it, you better show up then because that's when you can really make some stuff happen, um, you know, by talking to the people that actually put processes in place and listen for different opportunities on how to work together to be better. Um, and I know from attending those myself, you know, that it's it's helped out and it's helped me understand their process on the manufacturing side and how to help out in the dealer bodies as well. So I strongly recommend, you know, attending. Chris, did you guys? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. My, 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 my only addition, Travis is a thousand percent right. If you don't show up and, and have the conversations and they're incredibly constructive conversations, it is not a listen to one dealer's horror show that they had because we were, you know, look, we all have good things and bad things, but it, it is a really constructive conversation. Yeah. I talked with the guys from Alliance and, and, and Forest River when I was out at open house and they're excited. They can't wait. They're, they're really looking forward to it because they find this a really valuable platform uh, for them. And, and they take away, I, I for certain know that Alliance implements half the stuff that they, 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 they can do. There's just so, so much. You just don't have enough time to do it, but they definitely are, are excited to go. But yeah, exactly right. Travis. If you don't show up, you're not going to do it. One other thing is I noticed Phil, I, did we did the medic always do a pop meeting or is this no this is the first time we've ever yeah. had a uh uh partners of progress meeting with a supplier and a major supplier like Dometic. so um you know that's that's something that that's you know, cool. pretty much all dealers can attend that because yeah. uh everybody deals with Dometic on some level uh so that that will be interesting and it's the first time we've ever done one with a supplier hmm. Hmm. interesting um, one of the other questions or, or one of the topics I wanted to have you guys talk about as far as Con Expo, Convention Expo is concerned is, um, is this the first year you're doing a day dedicated to, to fixed operations? We've always had uh, a fixed operations component. Yeah. But, um, you know, this year with the attention on repair event cycle time, um, we really wanted to bring it home and also provide some flexibility for people who just want to come in maybe for a day or two. Um, this is the first time we've ever offered like a single day registration where they're going to just be focused on a, on a topic. There'll be other day uh, things going on at the convention on that Thursday, November 14th, but that fixed operations day literally is packed with information to help parts, service, and warranty administration. And the Learning Center just launched this year its uh, Warranty Administrator Education Program. And, you know, I don't know if if Chris and, and um, Travis agree with me, but we've had very little education available for warranty administrators. It's totally a school of hard knocks type of uh, <laughs> position. Well, now the Learning Center and our partners that are working with us at the convention are providing really vital um background information to help warranty administrators do the job better and serve customers better and get people on the road quicker. So we don't have all these bottlenecks. And I know I don't know if you have more to add to that, Chris or Travis. Yeah, I mean I do. The 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 thought process behind it is that if if we can put our warranty administrators and service advisors in our dealership in the same room with the folks that they're talking to on the other end then 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 those email communications and text messaging communications we all know what happens you know when you get an email and you read it you may be reading it differently than the intention was right so when they get to i find and i do this in my dealership with my my warranty admins i find when when my warranty admin make friends with the people over at forest river and and keystone because those are our primary our primary vendors that 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 things get done so much quicker and that's got that's where that's where i feel like we we miss the repair event cycle time timing thing the big bottleneck is between the text in the front and the front of the house not not communicating right and they're they are communicating but it, the bottleneck comes in well somebody sent me an email and they told me no 
Well, did you pick up the phone and call him? Did, did, do you have somebody in there that you know that you could say, hey, man, we need to talk this out because this customer is really upset and it's taking too long and yada, yada, yada. So the thought process was, let's get him in the same room. Let's get you show us how you want us to process warranty claims so we can do it the quickest and most efficient way to turn those units around as fast as possible. And, and I think yeah. the, the the track that we have lined up, like Phil said, is so so complimentary towards that day. It's I think it's a home run, home run. Very uh, good. Yeah, I, I, we're on the, on the clock. As far as the clock goes, we're we're about there. Um, loose ends, Rick. That you wanted to, uh, other questions you didn't get to ask. No, it just seems to me. Uh, if you don't mind me making this suggestion, uh, uh, maybe we need a FEMA workshop at Con Expo. <laughs> Yeah. We've we've had a we've had FEMA there before and uh there 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 is a process and we we did get a lot of dealers sign up to be vendors at that at that situation and that was I think the year or two after um we had uh, more flooding down in Florida or maybe it was Texas but you know unfortunately or fortunately uh dealers have begun you know over these last ever since Katrina have become more well versed in this area, and uh, and have signed up to be you know FEMA uh, contractors, and so you know FEMA's process is supposed to be they're supposed to work in the states that are in fact impacted first, and then spread a wider net if they need more more units. But at this point, like Travis said, we don't know what that need is going to be. They've got to do their first job is is uh, to deploy search and rescue and and relief. And you know, get make sure people are safe, and then look at the more long-term emergency housing needs that the travel trailers have been used for in the past. Okay. The, uh, uh, be before we sign off, I did want to remind everybody of the top fifty. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Top fifty. That's uh, that's on Wednesday. Looking forward to that. And I do. If people. Um, listen to all the way through to the end of this. <laughs> I got a special code for them, which means that they can register for the convention at the lowest rate. And that code is RVDAEBR24. So if they use that code and register for the convention, even though the deadline is passed for advanced mm -hmm. registration, that'll get you our best rate. And, uh, and people who've already registered, if they want to be uh, bring more people, they can use that code to get the best rate. So they don't have to pay the rack rate. They can play the, the advanced registration rate because I, Chris, I think you agree. It, you know, it's, it's times like this when the convention is even more important to the well being of the, the overall dealer body, because we really need to work together to make sure that we can have this recovery that we think is coming in 2025. Absolutely. Well, very good. I, Sherm. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah. gentlemen, uh, seriously, uh, appreciate the heck out of it. And uh, Rick. So to sign off, thank you again, gentlemen. Thank you, Eric Sell, our sponsor. Um, let's uh, hope and pray that Hurricane Milton is um, somewhat less than what every forecaster is saying it's going to be. And uh, uh, Travis, best of luck, continued luck with uh, the recovery efforts out there in your neck of the woods. Thanks, gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks for Thank the opportunity. You Thank you.